Mediastinum. Yes, do you know? We have thoracic cavity. located in the thoracic cavity between two lungs and it is superior to the diaphragm. Okay, sorry, couldn't come up with the black pen, so if you can't see the red, sorry. I would know where it is located according to certain aspects. Probably going to say, yes, it's found in the mediastinum, but specifically, probably the question is going to ask, it's between the two lungs, it's above the diaphragm, and it sits medially. And it sits in the thoracic cavity. And this area, of course, is called the mediastinum. The heart is enclosed in three layers of a sac. This is called the pericardial sac. There are three layers to it, just like what you learned about in lung. The most portion, the portion that sits right on the heart is probably going to be the parietal part, not probably, but the fibrous pericardium is a loose fit. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I'm a little bit upset right now. This place is a mess. Hmm. Okay. The heart's enclosed by three <coughs> pericardial membranes. You need to know them. The fibrous, the parietal, and the visceral. The fibrous is going to be the outside portion of the sac. It's made of connective tissue. They sort of talk about it here in your book. <coughs> Underneath the heart wall. I'm just giving you a little bit more information about it. The parietal peri uh, pericardium is the serous area. This portion. So it would be this portion sitting against the visceral portion. Visceral portion is if we opened that sac around the heart, we would see the heart itself. And that's the uh, visceral portion. The part that lays on top of it would be called the parietal. And this part is called the fibrous portion. There is a question about that on the test, talking about one of those three layers. Okay. Between the parietal portion, which was this portion laying, and the visceral, there is a small space that's filled with serous fluid, just like with the lung and the pleural, pleura. There was a space, there is this space here, and this is serous, and the reason why we have serous fluid in there is why? What was the reason for the lung? Do not show up while Correct. It's for friction, that magic word that comes in there, friction, so that it doesn't rub and cause friction. We've got serous fluid there. That serous fluid then is made by this parietal part here. Now, the heart can't take that much fluid in here as the lung could. Remember, we could get maybe a thousand cc's, maybe even more of serous fluid around the lung 
Yes, eventually it constricted the lung where the lung wouldn't be able to expand, but you could put more fluid there. Here, it doesn't take much before it impedes the ability for the chambers to fill with fluid and then contract. So it's very important when we talk about pericarditis that this pericardium here that's supposed to decrease friction now all of a sudden works against us and doesn't open and close along with the contractions of the heart. This is going to be called then the pericardial um, cavity. Now you know that the heart has four chambers. We have a chamber in both of our atrias and a chamber both in our ventricles. I want to make sure that I give you everything. <coughs> this area around the chambers is a muscle. What is that muscle called? Myocardium. 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 You need to know that. Remember it. Each one of the chambers is lined with a specific type of tissue. That area then is called the what? endocardium 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 lines all chambers and great vessels and valves the reason why we have endometrium in all of these great vessels the pulmonary artery that goes over the aorta, the valves, everything coming in. Does anyone know what the endocardium is for? To prevent uh, blood clots and Correct. the blood can flow freely. So that means that in order for the heart to not cause any clots, we have to keep the endometrium free of any type of injury. Because if there's an injury, then we have a blood clot there to control it. If there's a blood clot there, then it's going to attach on to all other red blood cells, platelets, fibrin, and cause this clot to be bigger. Or, i.e., when we get into another disease process called endocarditis. Itis meaning inf inflammation, endocarditis meaning that we've got a bacteria here, it seeds itself in there, and very difficult then to kill. So even though we treat endocarditis with massive antibiotics, sometimes it's not enough to even cure the patient. And it's a long-term process. Um, so it's very smooth. Where else do we see endocardium? If we're talking about endocardium, but we call it different. Where else do we see this smooth lining. Arteries. Okay, we want to see smooth lining in our arteries for the same reason in our cardiovascular or in our vascular system. We're going to find out in cardio that we're going to be talking about some disease processes that have to do with our arteries and when that is not smooth for some reason we have trouble with clots getting into different portions of our body, organs, or extremities. Alrighty, well, 
it's either my class, I don't think it was, so it's got to be his evening class, or it's got to be his other morning class. Well, I don't think it was you guys, because you left last Tuesday, right? To go for orientation. Well, somebody took off with my little box, and I hope they enjoy my expo pens. Darn it. That's what happens. I should have known better. But I thought. Okay. Um, the upper chambers are called the atrias. You will have to remember your flow. How does blood flow through the heart? The upper chambers are right and left. They are separated by a septum. This septum is called the interatrial inter septum. Interatrial. These are very thin walls here. They accept the blood. The amount of blood that usually is pumped every uh, contraction is about 80, 60 to 80 mLs. That's every contraction. So within a minute, if you add that up, that's almost our total amount or our total amount of liters within our body that we carry. So every minute we have pushed through all the blood supply and oxygenated and sent it to the cell and came back for more oxygen. So anything that interferes with that is going to cause a problem when we get into it. The lower chambers, the ventricles, have thicker myometrium because they pump the blood to the lungs from the right and out to the body from the left. Now the left has a thicker muscle area. The reason why is because it has to pump this blood with a blood pressure to get it all the way down to your little toe. And this pressure up here in the aorta is controlled by our body with sympathetic response or peripheral vascular resistance. It is that peripheral vascular resistance that is going to cause this left ventricle to either pump more or harder or less. A lot of this peripheral vascular resistance we're going to find is controlled by heart rate. As our heart rate goes up, we vasoconstrict. As our heart rate goes down, we vasodilate. That's concept. You need to know that at all times. You're going to learn to know that because that's going to be an answer to your thinking process when you start answering questions in cardio. That's a mess up there. Yes? May you repeat the... Oh, no. <laughs> OK. PBR. The, the HR event. OK, as the heart rate goes up, we vasoconstrict. Or our heart rate goes up because of vasoconstriction out here in the periphery. As we dilate, as this goes from this to this, our heart rate is going to go down and our blood pressure is going to improve. Sorry. 
Um, <clears throat> does that make sense? Yes. So, whenever we think about dilation or constriction, and you have found out back in muscular skeletal, you know that if you apply ice, what does it do? It constricts. It constricts. So what's it going to do? It's going to clot off. And if we were to put it to the big areas, uh, the um, carotid or, or under our arms or whatever to a big vessel, it's going to make that vasoconstrict also. And if we apply heat, we dilate. So we're doing the same thing when we apply cold and heat. <clears throat> These ventricles here are separated by a septum also. It is called the interventricular septum. Now mostly, all of this is going to come um, you're going to hear about it again in term four in pediatrics because there are certain holes in these areas that close after birth. So we already have a problem with the possibility of these holes not really um, keeping closed so it can cause us problems later on in adult life. <coughs> but we're not going to get too much into that. Okay, the right atrium receives blood from where? The inferior superior vena cava. Superior. Everybody knows that, right? Inferior superior vena cava. Which one's the inferior? Down one. And it comes into the right atrium. Through right aspect wall. And then into the right ventricle through this valve. Yeah, right. Tricuspid. Tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Yes. Out yes. through this valve. Semilunar. Okay, semilunar. What else can it be called? Mitral. Where is it going into? The lungs. The pulmonary artery. So this can also be called then the pulmonic valve. Okay, semilunar means that it's just the valve looks like this. Two sides, semi. Okay? Tricuspid means that it looks like this, three-sided, or three flaps. Okay? So it goes into then the pulmonic artery, pulmonary artery, and it goes to the left lung and to the right lung via the pulmonary arteries. It comes back to the left atria via the what? Pulmonary, pulmonary veins through the bicuspid. bicuspid or mitral valve. Known by both because they are referred to equally in questions. They may say mitral, they may say uh, the bicuspid valve. They go into the left ventricle, then out through the aortic, aortic valve into the aorta. What is right here, right after the aortic valve? Anyone know? Is anyone saying it and I'm not picking it up? What are these? Those are the coronary arteries. Okay? Coronary arteries come right off, right after the aortic valve. So what gets blood first? The heart. The heart. What gets blood second or first, however you think about it? The brain. Concept. If we don't have a good cardiac output, what are we affecting? The heart. The heart and the brain. What are going to be our signs and symptoms then? What does lack of oxygen cause? Okay, LOC up here. So that's your first sign. And what's your second sign for heart? Breathlessness. No, that's a later sign, but a good sign. Breathlessness. Chest pain. Or who, whoever said chest pain is correct. Chest pain. In the periphery and everywhere else except for the brain, if there is a lack of oxygen, 
you get pain first. Because lack of oxygen does what? Damages cells. Damages cells into the fact that cells then start to die. It takes time for cells to die. The longer we have a lack of oxygen, cells will eventually start to die. And that's why when we call an MI a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, we then know that there has been time. It has not happened just like that, like with PAD, peripheral artery disease, where a clot goes down and automatically shuts off blood. You get extreme pain right there, sudden. Here, you have time to try and reverse the lack of oxygen with an MI, because if we have an MI, that means we have had death of heart tissue. That heart tissue will repair over time, but it depends upon how much heart tissue was damaged in the first place as to whether or not we're going to have time to repair it. Okay. Alrighty. When we talk about the atria here, Oh, I might as well. Everybody's got that, right? When you go to take the test, I don't mind you writing on the back of your page and putting down a heart so that you can visualize it. Visualize what you are seeing and what the question is asking you. In the atrium here, I told you that we should have 60 to 80 mLs coming into it at a time and being pumped through. As we get more fluid, you just drank a thousand cc's, four cups of water. Everyone knows that that's four cups of water, I hope. <laughs> well, a cup of water is about 240 if you want to go by 8 ounces times 30, 240. But in actuality, if you just sort of round it 10 more cc's, 250, then that's about 4 cups of water for 1,000 cc's. That influenced this to, I'm making up numbers, okay? But I'm saying that now we have 100 mLs coming in to this atria that is not normal, right? Because normally we're 60 to 80. This causes the atria then to stretch. The atria, atrias, because what we have on one we have on the other, is now going to have to push 100 mLs down into the ventricles. It's going to have to have force behind it. And this is now going to get 100 mLs to go over to the lungs. And this is going to have stretch force also. So that's where we get to those words that I have on your papers there of um, preload and afterload. Preload is the amount of stretch that the muscle must take to push the blood through the rest of the heart and out to the body. Yes? I didn't get it, the stretch, when the fluid goes in the ventricle, right ventricle? Yeah, this is going to have to stretch to accommodate 100 mLs, okay? Because it's been used to getting the normal 60 to 80. I'm just using 100 mLs. Anything over and above. This, this is a concept that you will need to kind of understand because when this stretches, it's going to take more force from the muscle to push it now down into the ventricle 
and it's going to take more force of the ventricle to push it to the lung and to the rest of the body. Does it also cause the aorta to stretch as well? No, the aorta won't, well, <clears throat> I guess it might stretch. Uh, it, it might stretch. It probably have to. Well, no, the aorta is kind of big. Yeah, it just stretches on its own. And so what's going to happen if it does stretch, then it's probably going to cause hypertension with that added volume. That is what is preload. Now, there's also what we call in this stretch, this atria <coughs> senses how much blood is coming into it. It is that amount that then signals the heart or the right atria in here to send off a hormone that says I have too much fluid. There's too much fluid in the body. That hormone is called anti, or, um, oh, remember Jeanette, remember. Uh, atrial nutriatic, and I'm a terrible speller, addict. Uh, hormone, ANH. This is the first of your hormones that you're going to need to remember. <coughs> ANH is put into the bloodstream hormone. It goes to the kidney. Do you remember your A and P of the kidney? Mm -hmm. Now in heart, we not only just talk about heart, we talk about all other systems. In cardio, cardio affects respiratory, it affects kidney, it's probably going to be affected by the liver, which is GI, it's affected by many other systems. ANA, glomerulus, proximal loop distal. In your A&P, what did you learn about in the distal uh, nothing. Okay. But you will remember. The urine is forming. Now. Urine is forming. Yes. And we have a lot of hormones that come in here. And Mr. Uh, I know Mr. Hernandez went over this, but this comes into our angiotensin. Angiotensin. Aldosterone. Um, system along with antidiuretic hormone and all these hormones that are influenced by too much water or too little water in our body. That means here ANH goes and blocks aldosterone. If you remember, aldosterone's job, and you'll need to remember it forever, and this is renin, angiotensin aldosterone system. Aldosterone's job is to absorb sodium. Along with sodium will come water. And in place of that, it will deplete potassium. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. yes. Vaguely, do you remember that? Now it comes into play that you need to know it. ANA, ANH is going to come over here and block aldosterone because we have too much fluid. 
We don't want to reabsorb any more fluid, do we? We want to get rid of that fluid because it is taxing the heart. The heart has to pump harder because of too much fluid. Do you understand that portion of it? In order to do that, our body is made up of areas that signal and start working right away. A ANH is going to come and block aldosterone, no more reabsorbing, and there's going to be an increase in urinary output. That's why <clears throat> after you've drank a couple of glasses of water, you then, in about an hour or so, have to go to the ladies' room or men's room and relieve yourself of that amount of water. And that's because this naturally took place. Got it? All right. Take a break. Everybody's getting up and walking out anyway.